Well, my dear friends, at long last we make our way back to Darktown. The last time we were here, we bore witness to four stories of murder, mystery and intrigue. On this visit, we delve further into the mysteries of this typical Midwestern city, with three tales that go to prove that the strange goings-on go beyond those of the mere human imagination. Stay with me, my dear friends, and I'll keep you safe as we travel through Dark Town. On our last visit, we ended up in the suburbs and witnessed some poor, unfortunate events that led to murder. This time, we venture slightly further out and into the largest wooded area of Dark Town, and specifically to a path known as Sarah's Trail. What secrets does it hold, and what might we find there? Let's see. I've lived in this town all my life, and I've never experienced anything more life-threatening and horrific than when I traveled through Sarah's Trail. I was only 16 at the time, and a real adrenaline junkie. To me, the trail was just a convenient path that made travels from my friend Chloe's house to my house shorter in time. The trail began near the local Walmart, where the back of the store led into a forested area, and it stretched all the way to the other side of town, where most of the housing complexes were, including mine. My history teacher had told us one day, during a lecture, that the trail was the remains of what used to be railway tracks, constructed for the old railway system but rotted away after years of neglect due to the business being sued in the 1920s. Apparently there had been a train that derailed, killing about 200 people in the spring of 1923. This was because the track had not been laid properly, and the business neglected to fix them. But that wasn't the only dark history behind the trail. If you ask locals about the trail, or those who had been living there during the summer of 1967, they would tell you the story of Sarah Ann Bluer. She'd been in grade 12, a real ambitious art student. She'd worked on the church mural downtown, her signature painted among the rest of her peers as remnants of a lost, spirited youth. One night she decided to sneak out, which, according to her mother in later interviews, was unlike her, to attend the end-of-year party being held by the prom queen of 1967. During the party, Sarah decided to leave early and make her way back home using the trail, her mind in a drunken state. People at the party claimed that they didn't even see her leave. Of course, at that point, they were all probably so drunk they didn't know which way it was up. They found out the next morning that Sarah Bluer had not returned home that night. Posters were put up, search parties organized. My grandmother who told me the story, had been part of the search. She told me how they searched that whole stretch of trail, all areas of the forest. The town searched for a whole month, but no one could find the bluer girl. One day, a teacher from one of the search parties stumbled upon Sarah's bracelet, lying in the grass a kilometer off the trail. A few centimeters from that was a severed arm, rotted and crawling with maggots. The nails were painted a lime green. Around the arm, the trees and leaves appeared to be smeared in dried blood. The creepiest part about it was the fact that one tree had the words THEM painted on it. Of course, they discovered it was Sarah's blood and her fingerprints. She had been the one who painted the words. The cops investigated for years, looking for a suspect. They never found her body, or the person responsible. Rumors spread around town. Some said she was murdered by a crazed local farmer, and her body was ground up into meat and sold on the market. Others said she was murdered by vengeful spirits of Locomotive 99, the train that had derailed. Everybody had their own theory on what had happened to Sarah Bluer. 
and they had their own stories to tell about the trail. A few months after her disappearance, her family spoke up about hearing what sounded like a girl crying in the woods in their backyard every night when they let the dog out. Of course, they were ridiculed for their claims, people thinking it was just a hoax and all. But then more people came forward. A girl named Jessica claimed that she walked the trail home one evening and saw in the distance a strange light that illuminated the darkness. She said that as she got closer, she could hear the cries of a girl. She ended up running back to her friend's house and getting her mother to pick her up. But the scariest count was the one that happened to a classmate of mine. Jimmy was coming home from a party one night, taking the trail by himself. Apparently, as he got closer to the end of the trail, he could hear the screams of a girl. He described them as painful, desperate shrieks for help. Then, as he got closer, he could see in the distance a girl. He said she wore a pink dress, her skin pale as day. She had reddish blonde hair and red eyes that were bleeding. She had stood frozen in the middle of the trail, staring at him. He told me that her mouth had been open, eyes wide as she screamed at him. Blood dripped down from where her arm had been severed off. Jimmy had run down the trail, not bothering to stop until he got back to the party. He swore he would never take the trail ever again. So, why had I taken it? To be honest, I was a skeptic. Sure, Jimmy was a great guy, but he always drank too much at parties. And people like to make up stuff like that for attention. Besides, that particular night... Chloe and I had been home alone, as her parents had been out of town for a party. And my parents worked out of town, so they couldn't pick me up. So the trail had been the best option. I had left Chloe's late, around 10.30 it must have been, and made my way to her backyard, where the trail began. I remember that particular night had been really hot, and I would taken my blue hoodie off, hanging it off of my shoulder as I walked. The woods had been pitch black. The only source of light coming from my flashlight. It was an old grey thing that barely lit the path. So, I was pretty much in the dark. I must have been twenty minutes into my walk when I began to feel cold. I was confused as there was no breeze, or any source for the cold air. It was like all of a sudden, I was freezing. I pulled my hoodie on, my body still cold as I walked faster. I was looking around now, the dark suddenly feeling suffocating. My heart began to race, adrenaline rushing through my veins. I sped up as the woods grew darker around me. The flashlight had suddenly begun to flicker, and the stream of light dulled. I hit it against my hand rapidly, the light still flickering. The path was black now, the outline of the trees around me. The night sounds suddenly became louder, the crickets chirping in my ears, the sounds of a twig snapping. I was extremely on edge. I gave up on my flashlight and instead began to run, my heart booming in my chest. And that's when I saw it. A light in the distance, illuminating the end of the trail. It was a green light, smoking like dry ice. I'd frozen in place the fear overpowering me. The shapes of people walked out from the lights. It had been a row of six black figures with pointy heads and pure red eyes. I didn't know if they were human or not. It was too dark to tell. They moved slow, almost like zombies, towards me. I could hear whispers around me suddenly, like they were in the bushes at either side, like they were surrounding me. I began to turn to run, when I came face to face with bloodshot eyes and pale skin. A girl stood right in front of me, her wide eyes staring at me. Blood covered her skin. Her mouth was wide open, her teeth all missing as she screamed. Her right arm dangled like it was lifeless. Her left arm was missing. A bloody stump in its place. 
I gasped, falling backwards as I ran off the trail into the woods. I had to get out of there, off that trail. My reasoning skills were clouded by my consuming fear. I must have tripped a couple of times through the woods over branches and bushes until I finally made it to a backyard. The back porch light was on and it looked like people were in the house. My lungs had burned from my escape. I made my way to the house, looking behind me in fear. I jolted as the figure stood a couple of meters away, just watching me. They were motionless, pure black. I began to run again, tripping over the porch steps. I banged the sliding door, tears falling from my eyes. I turned around again. Intimidated by the figure's red, motionless stares. The owner of the home had opened the door, shocked at my fear. It was a woman whose husband had been out of town. Her children were sleeping and she said she was up late getting laundry done. She asked me what had happened, why I was so scared, and if I wanted to call my parents. I told her about the people in the woods, how they were still out there watching the house. She investigated, looking from behind the sliding door of the woods. I told her they had pointy heads and red eyes. She began to look at me skeptically, replying that she saw nothing. I couldn't believe it, going to look to see for myself. I thought maybe the glass made it hard for her to see, so I was prepared to point them out for her. But, to my surprise, they weren't there anymore. The woods just stared back at me, dark and normal. The woman had asked for my telephone number and had called my mother. She left work immediately, coming to pick me up across town. She'd interrogated me, asking if I'd taken any drugs or alcohol, got into anything I wasn't supposed to. I begged her to believe me, that what I saw was true. The next day she called the local police station and gave them my statement. They searched the woods, looking for the pointy-headed people and the bloody girl. They found nothing. They concluded, in their minds, that I was either crazy or looking for attention. My story was also passed around school, people calling me crazy all the way to my graduating year. That was 1999. Now I'm a 34-year-old writer, still living in town. I chose a house, however, closer to downtown and away from the woods. Despite that, I find myself traveling the forest during the day, searching. I have obsessed over that experience, trying to figure out an explanation, going through tons of articles at the library, hundreds of books on the story of the town. I discovered more about the town's history. During the First World War, there had been an elementary school just off the trail that had burned down one day during class. It killed 11 students and a teacher who had been trapped in the growing smoke and could not find their way out. The ages of the dead students were between five and nine. No one knows how it started or who was responsible. Then, in 1950, three teenagers hung themselves out near the falls deep in the woods. A surprise to the residents, who described the students as full of life and ambitious. None of them had showed previous signs of depression or suicidal thoughts. Yes, it seems the town had a dark side, all connected to those woods. I speculated for years, trying to figure out the reason for all of the deaths. I still don't know why so many horrible things had occurred near there or how it connected to my encounter. The only thing I was sure of was that the girl I saw in the woods that night was Sarah, and her spirit must be stuck in those woods forever, suffering. It made me sad, thinking about how she had to spend eternity roaming the woods where she had died. And what about those pointy-headed people? The image of them painted in blood always popped into my brain. Did they kill Sarah? Did they kill the teens? Did they burn the school? What were they? Were they even human? All questions still unanswered. And did I even want to find the answer? 
Those things that are in the woods are evil and are better left hidden. I know that. But part of me needs to know, needs a conclusion. That's why I'm writing this as a possible goodbye note. I know what I'm about to do is dangerous, and I honestly don't know if I'll come back from my trip. I just know that if I don't go to the trail tonight, if I don't discover what those beings are, the unknown will make me go crazy. So, I say farewell to my family, and I hope they can forgive me for leaving and finally see that all those years I was right about the woods. I love you, Mom. And I know that even though you thought I was crazy all these years, you continue to care for me and stand by me. Dad, I'm happy that you and Mom are still together all these years, and I hope you can both forgive me. I just want someone to believe, so that whatever evil is out there in those woods can be revealed, and that no more death or destruction can occur. I can't live knowing what I know and just standing by as innocent people die. And for the people reading this other than my family, I'm telling you now, if I die in those woods, it was the evil that killed me. You need to know that the trail is a death sentence and that Sarah still lurks, her dead red eyes watching anyone who walks past. All of their dead eyes are watching. I'm telling you, never ever walk Sarah's trail. Unless you want your blood spilled around the leaves and trees of the woods. Never ever walk Sarah's trail. Unless you want to become part of the forest and part of them. Well, you heard everyone. Better stay away from Sarah's trail. But that's not the only place where we're going to find strange goings on. A little further off, just by the woods, we now come across a young girl who's trying to keep safe during a thunderous lightning storm. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. Your child may be gone, but there's no need to mourn. I live in an isolated place, a big old neighborhood where the homes are further apart and ravines cut our yards deep. My house is isolated even more from the others, separated by a screen of oppressive pine trees, swaths of dead grass and acres upon acres of ragged trails. My parents never let me explore those paths. They said people often lost their way, even in our neighborhood. Why, just last month, a little girl had disappeared during a massive storm surge. My parents had been incredibly distraught about it, moaning about how important it was to heed those warnings. Word was, she was never found. I was smart enough to listen, though. I stayed inside, under my covers, and watched as the lightning tore jagged, white-hot paths across the sky. A few moments later, the jaw-tingling boom of thunder would sound. My parents were asleep in the room above mine. They taught me how to gauge the distance of a storm, wait for a flash of light to fill the night sky, count by Mississippis, and divide by five. For every five seconds, the storm was a mile away. I had a tough time with numbers other than five. We were only just learning how to divide in school. I counted to ten Mississippi this time, before the thunder rolled over me, filling my ears with a cacophony of brass roars. The sound didn't scare me. In an odd way, it was rather comforting affording me the false security of the brick and glass that separated me from the elements. Neither the blinding light nor the deafening tremors could reach me. I looked up at my ceiling, watching the shadows of the trees shutter across the rough, white paint. An eerily beautiful sight. My ragged, fleece blanket was knotted in my arms, and my head cradled in an overly plush pillow. I lay prone, waiting for the next crash of thunder. 
It filled my ears at Aid, Mississippi this time. I rubbed the blanket with my cheek, struggling to do the math, about a mile and a bit away. As the thunder died away, a different sound permeated my perfect silence. A creak followed by a dry scuff, then silence again. My neck hairs prickled, and I curled in harder against myself. Another flash spread throughout the room. I felt thankful, feeling the familiar fear of nature's staggering power wash away any unease. I counted again, clutching my blanket close. Five, Mississippi. The storm was closing in, the thunder a harbinger of the damage that would follow. Another flash illuminated my room through the big window opposite my bed. I made out the purple outlines of the sparse trees beyond, shuddering briefly as I imagined being out there among them. At least I had my home, my room, my bed. Another peal of thunder washed over me, four Mississippis later. When it died, I heard yet another creak of the floorboards. I remained frozen, convincing myself there was no threat if I could not see it. A fresh flash of light blazed through my bedroom, and for a fraction of a second I made out a flicker of movement just to the right of my window. I stared at that spot in my bedroom, trying to detach some imagined entity from the well of shadows formed by the corner of my room. Just as my eyes settled on the darkness of that spot, a new flash bloomed within the darkness, and I was blinded once more. Groaning, I squeezed my eyes shut. I wasn't scared of thunderstorms. Dogs were. Other kids were. Even my parents jolted from the occasional crack of thunder. I did not. I observed them, measured their distance, took comfort from them. It took me a few moments to discover what was wrong with that last flash. No thunder echoed after it. I tried to recall my count but realized I hadn't done it. I waited for the next spire of lightning to blaze across the trees beyond, and actually sighed in relief when it did. But in that moment, something else caught my attention. As the lightning filled my room, a secondary burst of light seemed to pop up just beyond the fringes of my window. I peered hard into the trees as their purple-black outlines were electrified across my vision, but nothing else appeared. With another groan, I buried my head against my pillow and peeked out from under one guarded eyelid. The thunder rolled across my room at a three Mississippi count this time, but again an eerie creak seemed to dog at its heels. I scanned at my window, searching for any flicker of movement, but none appeared. There was nothing there, only Mother Nature in all her awe-inspiring power waging a war of electrified plasma and sonic concussions against the earth. I began to doze. My guarded gaze dipped in and out of consciousness, blurring and refocusing on the window. In my mind, I kept up the tally, wondering when the storm would hit us. Those flashes bombarded my eyelids, casting spectral outlines of the trees against the weird red void I got when I tried to squeeze my eyes shut. I found I was reaching out more with my ears for any discrepancies, cataloguing the thunder's ripples just as a flash flickered across my reddened vision. Exhaustion must have dulled my senses, because at some point I began to realize the thunder didn't always match up with the lightning flashes. Sometimes it would just be the flash, followed by a creak. I'd struggled to erase the creaking from my mind, burying one fear under another but it was getting harder to ignore. Fear paralyzed me, keeping me from reaching out into the darkness of my room to confront my suspicions. I kept gazing out of the window, praying for the next flash of lightning. Instead, the next flash popped up to the left side of my head. I saw in the window an outline of some sort, vaguely humanoid and thin. I yearned for it to be a tree, but a growing sense of dread took hold of the logical part of my mind. It was something far worse. Remaining still as a mannequin, 
I peeked from the cubbyhole of my covers and under my eyelid and applied the lightning distance principle to this new phenomenon. A flash, ten Mississippi, another creak. Another flash, seven Mississippi, another creak. Each pulse of light bringing to fruition the thing's gangly black limbs in my window. It was getting closer to my house. There was another flash, this one coupled with a lick of lightning. Five Mississippi. I couldn't hear the creak this time due to the thunder, but when the booming roar died away, I almost screamed. There was a breathing sound, raspy dry, almost hungry. It was coming from my left again. I clenched my blanket to my chest, trying not to sob from the revelation. The figure was in my room. I had been observing its reflection in the light of the flashes. Another blaze of light charged the room for a moment, followed by an additional creak. Ice coiled around my spine as I felt my covers gently crinkle and my mattress dip ever so slightly. Another flash accompanied by that disgusting breathing and a very faint whine of a Polaroid camera. I didn't move. Couldn't move. You don't roll over to face a terror. It went against every animalistic instinct we had. Instead, I lay there, feeling long, slender fingers coil around my sheets and the thing's weight shift even closer. I squeeze my eyes shut, abandoning my peephole. Lightning bloomed once again against my window and the outline of something grotesque hunched over my bed took shape against my eyelids. He breathed noisily, the camera dangling around his neck and his shirt unbuttoned. I shuddered as I felt his mouth touch the base of my neck, and then his tongue slip up along the back of it. In the window I could see him practically smothering me, his greasy clothes ragged with dirt and mud. He had a scratchy beard and his breath smelled of rotting meat. As he placed one gnarled hand on my thigh, and began brushing upwards. His lips hovered just above my ear, pulling back my dark hair and touching the skin. I wondered where you disappeared to, he said in a crusty whisper. Thought them woods claimed you. He rolled me over fully, a malicious grin splitting his pock-marked face. Glad you survived. He held up his camera. We're gonna have some fun now, right? I stared back at him. Wordless. He rose the camera to his face and took another picture. Then, he screamed. I guess he must have finally seen my face. The flesh sloughed off my skull. The tendons wrapped tight around my right cheek and jawline. The black socket of my left eye gazed back at him, condemning and joyful. He stumbled back off the bed, blubbering like a baby. I slowly followed. He'd come for me the month before, during another storm. He'd taken pictures of me for God knows how long, worming slowly into my bedroom and stealing me into the night. He knew the paths that twisted every which way beyond my home. Sure, no one would ever find us, but I'd escaped. I fled into the woods during that storm, but soon I too became lost. I'd fallen asleep, counting, counting for eternity. And then I'd awoken once more. It was during another storm. I knew where to go. My parents' grief could never be mended, but I could still make things right. I knew he'd come searching, crawling back to my room like a cockroach. And here he was, sobbing pitifully at the foot of a little girl's bed. I stepped off the bed slowly, watching him scramble back towards the window. There was nowhere he could go. 
A flash of lightning glinted off my alabaster skull, echoing through my mind as I knelt down beside the creep. Mercy does not await you, I intoned in a dry voice. Your remains shall never be recovered, never relinquished, never put to rest. He looked back with wild yellow eyes. I rested a skeletal hand on his shoulder. Now come, let us have some fun in the woods. He cried out as my grip tightened, then screamed blindly as my fingers pierced into his tendons, hooked his collarbone and dragged him behind. He kicked and flailed, writhed and sprayed garbled prayers into the night, but the thunder drowned him out. He couldn't stop me. Deep into the woods we travelled, further than any sane human might go. At some point, he passed out from the pain. The camera still dangled around his neck, filled to the brim with memories of his past atrocities. I came to a stop in a small clearing, where a tree split by lightning sat. There, I slung the bumbling creep at the base of the tree and slapped him to make sure he awoke. He looked around blindly, crusty features thick with fear. I lifted him into the splintered trunk of the oak and pierced his arms and legs with shattered wood. There he screamed and foamed, but unable to move as I stepped forward and took the camera from his neck. One picture, a flash in the night, I murmured, raising the camera to my socket and taking a candid. That is all anyone will remember you by. I stepped up and wrapped my fingers around his greasy neck before slamming the camera into his mouth, shattering his teeth and lodging it into his jaws. Pictures continued to roll off, illuminating his chest and throat as he wept and struggled weakly. I backed up, smiling, remembering the pictures he'd taken of me. I counted the time between each flash, slipping further and further into the woods. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Lightning flared and thunder roared, and I disappeared into the night. Police would never know what happened to the little girl who disappeared. There would be an area-wide search, missing posters, the whole nine yards but no one would ever find anything. The only thing the parents found that was remotely interesting was a bit of dirt in their child's bed, in a room that had been locked for weeks, and a single, solitary photograph buried under her blanket. A picture of a shattered oak tree and one simple phrase written on the back. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four. Your child may be gone, but there is no need to mourn. Hmm, in that story, revenge really was best served cold. Now, in the final of our three stories for this evening, we move a little further out, towards the city cemetery, where the goings-on are even more strange. The young man recalls the events of the past and his time spent in the cemetery. On the last day of July, 1993, I saw my first reanimated corpse. I had been spending my summer vacation with my grandfather, the head caretaker for the largest cemetery in the county, while my parents were overseas visiting relatives. In exchange for a weekly stipend of $75, I was to spend my mornings performing various chores around the cemetery grounds, including cleaning moss from cracked and forgotten headstones, and collecting wilted, sun-bleached flower arrangements for the garbage. That particular morning was spent preparing for a burial, and helping my grandfather repair a headstone that had been vandalized over the course of the previous night. We'd been working on it since mid-morning, and when we finally finished, the sun was high in the noon sky. After we finished cleaning up, 
I went to look for a comfortable spot to take my lunch break and read an old Lovecraft collection purchased the day before from a used bookstore. Meandering through a field of monuments and headstones, I made my way towards a weeping willow tree that stood out against the dark, coniferous forest that ran the perimeter of the cemetery. Before the willow, there was a small green tent, folding chairs, flowers, and a rectangular mound of dirt. Remnants of that morning's burial, a small green aluminum sign was pegged into the dirt a few feet from the opening. Its tarnished copper lettering identified the grave's inhabitant and lifespan as Grace Phillips, 1914 to 1993. Finding the shade of the tent to be inviting, I made myself comfortable on a couple of the folding chairs beneath it. I wasn't two pages into the story Dagon when I heard what I thought was a strange, muffled sound of thumping beginning to resonate from the capped burial vault in the grave before me. I looked at the hole and immediately dismissed the thought that I'd heard a sound coming from it. I was about to go back to reading when I heard it again. Curious, I set down my book, walked over to the edge of the grave and listened with intense concentration. A few seconds later, I was rewarded with not only more thumping, but a stifled scream. Terrified, I stumbled backwards, tripped over a row of chairs, and then bolted across the cemetery towards the memorial garden benches where my grandfather usually ate his lunch. I arrived, out of breath and panicked. I told him of the thumping and screaming, and he looked at me like I was insane, and had me lead him to the grave. Go get Henry! Run, boy. I sprinted through a maze of headstones and mausoleums towards the large aluminum storage garage that housed both the cemetery's landscaping equipment and a small office. A moment earlier, my grandfather had knelt down beside the grave and listened, just as I had done before. He would later describe what he heard as the most unnerving experience of his life. A voice from beneath a burial vault cap. I burst into the office, startling Henry to drop one of the bags of peat moss he was stacking in a wooden bin, splitting open at his feet. Damn it, why do you... I didn't let him finish. Between gasps for air, I told Henry that my grandfather needed him right away. Sensing trouble, he quickly forgot the bag and we took off running. Henry followed me with as fervent a pace as he could muster for a man of his age and stature. When my grandfather spotted us coming, he shouted for Henry to bring the goddamn back hoe around. Henry, who had worked for my grandfather for twenty years and had never questioned one of his orders, ran down the graveled road to where the back hoe was parked away from that morning's mourners. I joined my grandfather who then proceeded to lower himself into the grave and straddle the vault. He cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted into the vault. Hello? Can you hear me? We're going to get you out of there. He was answered by a muffled shriek. Off in the distance, I heard the backhoe's diesel engine sputter to life with an oily growl. Minutes later, Henry piloted the machine over the stone-pegged horizon its dented chrome exhaust pipe belching a thick cloud of blue smoke that trailed behind it. When it arrived, I stood back and watched as my grandfather instructed Henry, who manipulated the backhoe's arm into position over the grave. Henry jumped off the idling machine and removed a chain harness hanging from a makeshift steel hook on the side of the cab. He connected the harness to a loop of steel welded to the bottom of the scoop and then climbed back into the backhoe. My grandfather directed him to slowly lower the chains into the grave. Hooks dangled from the ends of the four rusted chains as the back hoe lowered the harness down into the grave. When the hooks were resting on the surface of the vault's cap, my grandfather waved for Henry to stop. He secured the hooks to the rebar loops protruding from each corner of the lid and climbed out. Henry brought the back hoe's steel arm up with a hydraulic whine lifting the cap off the burial vault. 
The rumble of the engine had drowned out any audible sound of movement, and it wasn't until the cap was resting on the grass beside the grave and the backhoe's engine switched off that we could hear the blood-curdling shrieking and furious thumping from within the stained hardwood casket. I watched in terror as Henry reluctantly climbed into the grave, straddled the vault, and used a screwdriver to force open the locking mechanism securing the casket's lid. As soon as the lock was sprung, the top lid sprung open and caused Henry to scurry from the grave with a startled grunt. He cursed under his breath as he came to his feet beside my grandfather and beheld the ghastly sight before us. My grandfather told me to look away, but I could not keep myself from staring at the loathsome display. The elderly woman in the casket was thrashing her hands around in a wild frenzy, as if she was fighting off an invisible attacker. Every muscle in her body twitched with uncontrollable spasms. Her eyelids fluttered, her irises and pupils concealed by white plastic caps the mortician had used to hold her eyelids shut. Yellow-tinged skin sagged over the emaciated, sunken face. Screams came through curled lips and teeth, artificially clenched with a crisscross of white suture thread. The wig she had been buried in had slipped off, exposing a railroad track of stitches that orbited the back of her head. An autopsy had been performed, her brain removed and weighed. Her head crashed against the burial vault as she spasmed, opening a deep gash on the side of her head. Pink embalming fluid welled up and dripped from the wound. Jesus Christ, what's wrong with her eyes? Henry asked, his voice wavering. My grandfather ignored the question. Shut and lock the gate, Henry. If anyone asks, we're closing for emergency maintenance. Get the gas can and some matches from the office on your way back. When he returned from the garage, Henry joined my grandfather at the edge of the grave. He handed the gas can to my grandfather. We watched with numb shock as he emptied the entire can into the grave and over the woman who was still very active and was now hissing at us. He tossed the can aside and snatched the matches from Henry's nervous, shaking hands. Stand back, he commanded, as he pulled a match from the book and struck it against the thin, brown strip on the back. He used the match to light the rest of the matches in the book. It flared to life in his hand, and he flipped it into the grave, igniting the gas with a loud whoosh. Even though I was stunned by the unexpected blast of heat, my eyes never left the sight of the impromptu cremation. I could see the woman still flailing in her casket, even as she burned. The plastic caps on her eyes melted down her blackening face like tears of white paint on cracked asphalt. The sutures on the back of her head snapped, and her scalp curled back as it burned, exposing ivory cranium. The embalming fluid in her body boiled and foamed from cracks in her charred skin. It took 20 minutes for the woman to stop moving. She and her casket were still smoldering when we recapped the vault and quickly filled it in. When we had the backhoe parked in its usual space next to the garage, we collected ourselves to the confines of my grandfather's office. We sat in silence at his desk as we pondered what to make of the horror we had all just witnessed. My grandfather broke the silence. He stated that we were to keep the day's events a secret that we would all carry to our graves. Before the end of the summer, we would find two more of what we began referring to as moving burials, and had cremated the reanimated corpses. We never spoke of the cemetery's secret to anyone, nor did we discover the reason for the atrocious things we found twitching and writhing in the ground. Two weeks ago, my grandfather died from a two-year battle with lymphoma. In accordance with his last wishes, 
He was buried in the same cemetery that he'd spent so many years caring for. I visit his grave every day, when I'm sure no one is watching. And I press my ear to the ground and listen. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.